honor actually to, to close this super nice uh, school. I think that we've all been super impressed by the quality uh, of this audience. I mean, we've been discussing this a lot among the, this, the teachers, lecturers, and uh, so thank you very much for being so uh, enthusiastic and for asking all these questions. Um, so indeed, thank you. So what we saw last time, let me just uh, summarize uh, what was the, the last topic that we discussed. So we looked at block oscillations in 2D lattice systems, right? You have a 2D lattice, you act on the system with a force. Importantly, you initially prepare a wave packet in a given block band of the system, and the force that you apply is sufficiently weak that this wave packet actually remains in a given band. This is the, the condition uh, for these types of, of physics. And that's a very important condition. And so what we saw is that along the direction of the force, you have regular block oscillations, like you have in 1D. But then we have identified, at least I showed you how one can de derive, uh, a new force, what, which is called the anomalous, uh, sorry, a new velocity, excuse me, uh, called the anomalous velocity, which creates a drift which is transverse to the applied force. Okay, and so let me just remind you, uh, so we had this force along the, the y direction, and then we had this velocity along the x direction, and we call this the anomalous velocity. And we saw that this could be expressed as the strength of the force along the y direction times some quantity that I called omega xy. And this was a function of the quasi-momentum, the mean quasi-momentum of the wave packet. Now I told you that this was actually derived in 19... 51 by Karplus and Luttinger in the context of the anomalous Hall effect. But I told you that uh, a modern interpretation of this object is, is that it's actually a geometric property of the Bloch band in which you perform the transport. And uh, the name of this geometric quantity is uh, Berry curvature. Berry because it's related to the so-called Berry or geometric phase. And curvature because it actually defines a curvature on a U1 fiber bundle defined over Q space. Now what I told you is that we could uh, look at an analogy with the Aronoff-Bohm effect. In the Aronoff-Bohm effect, a particle acquires a non-trivial phase upon encircling a certain flux. So there is a notion of mismatch under parallel transport in this uh, context of electromagnetism. And in that case, we have identified uh, the curvature in this electromagnetic context as being related uh, to the magnetic field, or in fact, to the field strength uh, tensor. So we saw this relation between gauge fields or magnetic fields and connections or curvature in the context of uh, fiber bundles. So we use this analogy in this context, and we said the following thing. Well, since this is, seems to be a curvature in Q space, well, maybe the right way to look at this is to say that this actually acts like a fictitious magnetic field in Q space. But then if that's the case, then one can actually look at what is the Lorentz force okay, in Q space. And what I showed you is that this Lorentz force is just the dual of the usual Lorentz force. So in Q space, that would be the velocity uh, in Q space cross this fictitious magnetic field that's expressed in terms uh, of a vector. So this would be the Lorentz force in Q space. Okay, it's not a very nice notation, but I said out loud wha what this meant. And uh, since Q dot is related or actually equal to the force acting on the wave packet, and since this is aligned along Y, and since this curvature or very curvature vector is aligned along Z, this resulted in uh, a, a velocity along the X direction, and this was the actual anomalous velocity <laughs> identified uh, by Karplus and, and Lettinger. Okay, so that, that was one of the, the main conclusions of the last lecture, but there is a step that I, of course, uh, skipped last time because I wanted uh, to, to explain this experiment performed in the group of Emmanuel Bloch, where they did this Aronov-Bohm Aronov experiment in Q space to, to, to look at this very curvature locally in, in some uh, Bloch band system. But so the step that I missed is the one where I would actually show you that this quantity which appears here in these equations of motion, this quantity is indeed a very curvature. Okay, so this is something that I would like to, to spend a couple of minutes on now, and then we will move on to the analysis of topological uh, transport properties. Okay, so that will be the, the first uh, goal, the first part of this lecture, but this is actually part three in chapter 
two, I guess. And uh, so this would be uh, the geometric uh, phase and uh, the Berry curvature. Right. So let's forget about Q space. That's actually a, 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 a specific example of what I'm going to say now. Let us look at the general problem where we have some Hamiltonian which depends on a set of parameters, and I will call these parameters big R. Okay, so R is a vector which contains a set of parameters. These could be your rabbi frequencies or detuning and some uh, quantum optic uh, problem. These could be uh, the quasi-momentum uh, components, qx, qy, that would be you know, the context of Bloch bands that we studied before. But here I would like to be uh, completely general. And so these parameters actually live on some manifold M. Okay, so let's draw this manifold. Okay, here it is. And so what we are uh, going to assume is that this Hamiltonian can be diagonalized at every point R living in M. Okay, so what we are going to write is that H, so just be sure about the notations, H of R, I'm introducing now a set of eigenstates defined at every point R. They satisfy uh, the Schrodinger equation. I will call this big E lambda. I'm introducing lambda, an index which labels the different eigenstates, okay, for each point R living in uh, M. Okay, so this is correct. So I suppose that such a, a thing is possible. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to represent these bands here in, in this, in this uh, system. So this is probably not ideal because M looks like a band, but you probably see what, what I'm doing here. I should probably use another color. These would denote my energy bands. This would be E lambda. There would be some higher band here. I'm sorry, this is not ideal at all. This would be E lambda plus one, etc. Okay, so these are energy bands. And now I'm considering the following problem. Suppose that I initially prepare my system in such an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I, I select one of these states here. I'm preparing my system in the eigenstate phi uh, of lambda, so here. And this corresponds to a certain configuration of my system parameters. Okay, so this is a point R, which I'm going to call R, R dot. Okay, so you see what I do. I have a, a quantum system, let's say an experimental system. I set my parameters to some value in this parameter space. I prepare my system in an eigenstate of my system Hamiltonian, and so this represents this point. And now I would like to consider the following problem. Suppose that I know slowly change the parameters of my system. Okay, so what this would do, let's use a lot of colors, this would correspond to following a certain path in M. Okay? And this path can be written, can I, yes, this path can be written as R of T. Okay? And so the question that, I, that I'm asking is what becomes to my initial state? What is the, the time dependent uh, wave function, which is the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger uh, equation. So the question that I'm asking is, starting from this state here, what happens to this state as this parameter is slowly varied? So using the um, adiabatic approximation, what this will actually tell me is that I will actually remain in this band. Okay, so I will remain here. This is true if the variation of these parameters uh, are um, related to a time scale which is much, much, much longer than the time scale set by this gap. Okay, so this would be a typical gap. So what we impose is that the time scale over which R of T uh, is, is varied is much longer than one over uh, delta. Okay, so this will set the adiabatic, adiabatic approximation. So I'm, I'm working in this regime, okay, this is very important. I assume that m all my dynamics will entirely take place in a given band. Okay, this will be crucial again for all these geometric properties uh, to appear. And as you can see, this is also consistent with the previous story uh, related to the Bloch uh, oscillations. Okay, so 
dynamics take place in a given band. Okay, so then the problem is simply to, to solve the Schrodinger equation. This is H of R, which now depends on time. So the, the problem is explicitly time dependent, right? And we're going to solve this Schrodinger equation using the adi adiabatic approximation, namely that this wave function has to uh, belong to this lambda manifold. Okay, at all times. This is what I explained here on the picture. Okay, so what does this mean mathematically? Unfortunately, I cannot write it here. It's really way too low. <laughs> so what this means is that uh, I can write an ansatz for my uh, wave function. What is this ansatz? Well, well, this is quite easy. What I'm going to say is that since I have to remain in the lambda manifold at all times, my state will actually begin, uh, be given by phi lambda at r at time t. Okay, this is what uh, this uh, approximation tells me. But there is an uncertainty in the phase, right? It's the only thing that can happen, right? I know I have to stay in this manifold, but there is still some degree of freedom, which is the phase of this uh, time-dependent uh, wave function. And so the only thing you have to do to solve this problem is to take this equation, this ansatz, and you plug it in this Schrodinger equation. Okay, that's as simple as that. You take two, you put it in one. And what this will tell you is what this t tau of t function is, right? So let's write this. I will give you the solution. It's, I will leave it as a, an exercise. So what you will find is that this phase has two contributions. The first contribution is reminiscent of the standard dynamical phase that uh, a state has while evolving with a, a given energy, right? This phase, uh, phi lambda, will evolve according to the energy E lambda. So there will be a, a dynamical phase associated with E lambda. But E lambda depends on R, which itself depends on time. So instead of having simply E to the minus I uh, ET, we have to an integral here over E lambda. Uh, sorry. And here I'm introducing some variable uh, term. So this will be the first uh, contribution to this phase, and this is what we call the dynamical phase. This is something you always have, and it's actually not so important for what I'm going to say in the following. We have to keep in mind that it's there, but in typical experimental situation, this phase is just completely irrelevant. But then there is another contribution, which is the one what, that we find interesting, which actually only depends on the path followed by uh, this R of T. Let's call this path gamma. Okay, so this is why we call it a geometric phase. It's a phase that only depends on the path followed by our uh, parameters. And I will write this as, so I will call this A of lambda, to refer to the fact that we have this transport in the manifold lambda. I will write this as a vector. And this phase can be written as the circulation of this vector along the path uh, gamma. Okay, and so this is what we call the geometric phase. So what you should appreciate here is that the dynamical phase is related to how long it takes for you to go from this point to this final point here, right? It's related to a notion of time. This geometric phase does not depend on time at all. It only depends on this gamma here, which is the path performed in parameter space. This is really crucial. But no, I, I didn't tell you what A uh, lambda was, and so let me introduce A lambda, this vector. This can actually be written simply in terms of these eigenstates, uh, phi lambda. And so there's an I in front, and there's a gradient defined in lambda space, so in terms of these coordinates R, phi lambda. So as you see, there is no dependent no dependence, sorry, on time here. This only depends on the eigenstate, 
the eigenstates of my local Hamiltonian here. And so what is the name of this quantity? Well, we will call it Berry connection. Berry because we will see in a second that this is related to the Berry phase, but we already understand what, uh, what we mean by connection or why the word connection appears here. As you can see, what we are doing here is really a parallel transport of our state. Right? If you now think of this problem in terms of fiber bundle theory, what we do is that we start with a given state here, and then we perform a path here in the base space, and we end up with a certain state, which is not simply the state which is defined at that point, at the end of the path. It's the state multiplied by something which seems to describe this transport. And actually, this is the connection which describes this parallel transport of the state along the path. Okay? So still ha have in mind that now that this object lives on a U1, uh, U1 fiber, and what we're doing is that we are transport par uh, parallel transporting this uh, object from one fiber to the other over this uh, base space here. Okay? So this justifies the word uh, or the name Berry connection. And remember that there is an index lambda here, which refers to the fact that every band will be associated with a certain uh, Berry connection. Now this was known, wha what I have derived here in two lines, was known for many, many, many decades, okay? But people thought it was completely useless. Why, why that is the case? Well, because people said, well, this thing can actually be gauge removed. Okay, so let me show you uh, what this actually means. So let's perform a gauge transformation. Okay, so we have our phi lambda, depends on R. And I'm going to make a gauge transformation, namely I'm going to introduce some new eigenstates defined over my parameter space. These are still eigenstates of my Hamiltonian, but now they will be related to the previous states through some phase that I'm going to write. Each I'm going to use the, the letter or what was it? Was it chi? Yes. Okay, so I'm just making a gauge transformation here. And so what we will see is that this quantity A here will actually be transformed in the following way. So we will have a new vector, A tilde, and this thing will be given by our initial A. So this still depends on lambda, of course we will have this new A tilde, which is given by A, plus or minus, in this case it's minus, the gradient with respect to R of this function chi, which depends on R. Sometimes I put the bar of my vector on top, sometimes below, it doesn't make a, a big difference. I hope you, you don't mind. It's just that sometimes when, when there's an index on top, I prefer to put the bar below and vice versa, but it's, I, I hope you, you don't mind too much. So what you see here, that's the important thing to, to realize, it has nothing to do with these bars being on top or below, is that this Berry connection actually transforms like a gauge potential, exactly like the gauge potential of electromagnetism. But here, this is not the gauge potential of electromagnetism. This is a vector which arises in this context of adiabatic motion in a given band defined over some parameter space. Okay, so this is like a gauge potential in Q space. Uh, it's not Q space here, it's R space. Right? So we recover this idea that we already discussed in the context of uh, the monopoles and the aronov bohm uh, effect that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between gauge fields, gauge potentials, and connections defined on a fiber bundle. Okay, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Good. So what I told you is that people were not interested in this phase before because it could be gauge removed. And indeed, if, if you obtain for a given gauge such a phase, well, you could say, let's work in another gauge where I would have this I, uh, A tilde, which would be zero. I just have to choose the right chi here, which eliminates my A, and I will end up with something here, which is zero. So I can always eliminate this phase. Okay, but this is not always true. So this is what was thought for 
for many or considered for many years, but then came Barry. Actually, all other people realized this before, but I'm not going to enter this, this debate. So what Barry says that, sure, this is true, unless you consider cyclic evolution. So what does this mean? It means that R at the final time Tf is equal to R at your initial time. I think I called this zero. And this is, yes, what I call R uh, naught, right? So the idea is that all this story is, is, is true, or it's, but if you consider a path here which is closed now, so if this omega here actually goes back to R dot, in that case, you can follow exactly the same, the same treatment here, but then in that case, you have a closed integral of the connection, right? But then we can always use Fock theorem, right? We can write that this is <coughs> A times TL. I use Fock's theorem. I say that this is I integral over the surface delimited by my loop here. This would be this big sigma here of some vector okay and how do I define this vector well this will just be the curl of my a lambda now what's so important about these cyclic evolutions well is that now we actually have an integral for the geometric phase so this is still the geometric phase geometric phase for a cyclic evolution but now the quantity which ap appears here is actually gauge invariant something you cannot remove under gauge uh, under a gauge transformation so this is a very important point this is gauge invariant this is something you can check right away this is gauge invariant so you immediately see the analogy with electromagnetism again we have this A here, which transforms like a gauge potential. Now we introduce this omega. Oh, sorry for the chalk. We have this omega here, which is given by the curl of A. This defines a gauge invariant quantity. Well, it's quite natural to say that this is what defines a magnetic field or a fictitious magnetic field in R space. And how are we going to call this quantity? We're going to call this the Berry curvature so now it's clear it's called Berry because this has to do with the so-called Berry phase namely the geometric phase under cyclic evolution cyclic adiabatic evolution and it's a curvature because indeed this quantity measures the mismatch of parallel transport after performing a closed loop okay this is clear I, I will not draw a new picture here but you start with a certain state, you perform a loop in parameter space, but you don't come back to this state. You come back to this state multiplied by a phase which is given by this gauge invariant uh, object, which can be written as an integral of this local object, which is the curvature. Okay, so I, I just want to, to emphasize that this indeed measures the mismatch of parallel transport. On this U1 fiber bundle, let's write it again, U1 fiber bundle over M, M being this manifold, which is our parameter space. Okay, so this is really crucial, and that was the main uh, message of the, the Berry's paper, which is that the geometric phase cannot be gauged away uh, for cyclic uh, evolution. And as you can directly see, if you apply these ideas uh, to the case of the Aronoff-Bohm effect, so in the case of el electromagnetism, A becomes the gauge potential of electromagnetism, omega becomes the magnetic field, this very phase here is becomes the Aronoff-Bohm phase, and so you can see that the Aronoff-Bohm phase is indeed a specific example of the Berry uh, geometric phase. Are there questions uh, on this? Okay. So there's one last thing that I would like to, to say, is that here I have uh, this omega which is related to A through the curl. We have an, expre uh, an expression here uh, for A 
uh, in terms of the eigenstates okay, of my local Hamiltonian over there. So let me just write down the components of this omega and let me again use this uh, trick or this idea that I can, that I can relate this vector to some, to some tensor. So the idea is that uh, this object here has some component uh, mu. Okay, that's the mu component of this vector that I have identified here. And I will introduce this Levicevita uh, symbol here. And so lambda always refers to the band index, right? So please don't confuse this with the, okay, let me put a parenthesis here. Uh, so alpha beta. Okay, so I'm always relating this vector to some uh, tensor here. So in mathematics, this would be a differential form of uh, order two. And so what the components of these ob of these objects are, uh, these are the following. So that's I derivative of my phi lambda with respect to the coordinate uh, alpha. Okay, that's the component alpha of my vector R over there. Then d phi lambda dr beta. Then minus to exchange alpha beta here. Okay, so this is just a simple calculation. You take the curl of this quantity here, then you make this transformation from the vector to, to the tensor, and you realize that the components alpha beta of this very curvature tensor are given by these partial derivative of the eigenstate phi lambda with respect to the parameters coordinates r alpha and r beta, and this defines a scalar product. Okay, so it's quite clear that if you take your parameter space to be q space, so r would, be, would have components qx and qy, okay, and if you consider that your states here, your phi lambda, or actually these block states that I had introduced before with some band index, let's say lambda, I think I, I used n before uh, for these things. So these are the u's defined in Q space. So okay, let, let me just add a title here. So when I go back to Q space in, in the problem of, of my block bands, R has these components, these eigenstates correspond to my block states. Okay, and then in that context, you find that the very curvature component, components uh, mu nu in the band n will be simply given by the derivative of my block states with respect to qx and qy here, and then there's this, this scalar product. Okay. Uh, sorry, x, y, so I'm going to call this x, y. Okay, the components x, y of the Berry curvature tensor is given by these partial derivatives of the block states u, n with respect to q, x, and q, y. And this is precisely the expression that Karplus and Luttinger identified in the anomalous velocity. Okay, remember that I wrote down this expression in the board yesterday. That's precisely what you get through time-dependent perturbation theory when looking at these semi-classical equations of motions and so on. Okay, so this ends this part, yes? Yes, but again, wh where do you have this idea of projecting uh, your dynamics to a given band? I mean, that, that's really crucial here. Right? So indeed, you can play this, you know, this game in many contexts, but the crucial idea is that you project your dynamics or formally your Hamiltonian into some sub subspace of your Hilbert space. If you don't do this procedure, then all what I'm saying here basically disappears.
So that's really, really crucial. Okay, so this ends this part. And while I'm erasing this board, let me really point out something which I found really crucial, is that the properties that I have described here are geometric properties. Okay, so I, I introduced the Berry curvature. I showed you that the Berry curvature is related to the mismatch of parallel transport. But as I told you in my very first lecture, these are geometric properties. Okay, these things happen locally in some space. It has nothing to do, or it's related, but it's still not topology. I think there was a question over there. Here? Ah, um, sorry. Um, uh, here? Ah. Ah, okay. Uh, here, it's the same expression, but you interchange alpha and beta. Okay? Uh, here, yeah, here is the same idea. I interchange Qx and Qy. Okay? Okay, so what I just said is that indeed we've been looking at geometric properties and this anomalous velocity over there is related to the Berry curvature, namely it's a geometric contribution to the velocity in these Bloch oscillation experiments. Now what we're going to look at are generalizations of these ideas, but where topology plays a role. Okay, so this is what I'm going to explain in the next couple of minutes. So whenever you read a paper which is about the Berry curvature and there is the word topological in the title, you should you know, be suspicious or curious about this paper. Um, okay. So this is actually a fourth, um, a fourth uh, section which I'm going to call insulators and their classification. So the idea is to go back to the system that we considered last time, which is a 2D lattice defined in the Y, X plane. We have a Bloch band system and we will uh, apply a force still along the y direction. That's exactly the same setting as last time. We have this notion that we have a couple of bands, right, in Q space. That would be E1, that would be e t E2. But we assume that we can basically stay in this band. We can project all dynamics in this given band. So what I told you last time is that the equations of motion can be written in this semi-classical approach where we consider that we have a, a wave packet here somewhere in a given band. So what we saw, I'm just repeating what we, we saw last time, is that this is given by, the velocity along x is given by the derivative of the Bloch band E1 with respect to Qx. Then we had this new velocity term in the, the first band the anomalous velocity. All these objects here depend on the mean quasi-momentum. I'm not going to write this down. We have that along the, the direction of the force, the velocity is just given by the band velocity. Okay, And then we have equations for the conjugate uh, variable. So we have that qx dot equals zero because there is no force along the x direction. And uh, qx, uh, sorry, qy dot equals to fy the force uh, strength along the y direction. So that was uh, the previous thing that we, we had considered. Now what we're going to consider is a situation where we, instead of having a wave packet, a local wave packet somewhere in Q-space, we're going to fill this band completely. And now this connects to this school on fermions. I will now consider that I'm setting my Fermi energy somewhere here. So that this band is indeed completely filled with uh, fermions. Okay, so this is the situation that I now consider. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, that means that my total velocity, in that case, 
can be written as a sum over all Qs of the velocities that we have uh, written before, right, which are expressed here. Now I explicitly uh, say that this depends on Q, right? And as previously uh, discussed in, I think it was Mira's course, this can be written as an integral. A now denotes the area of my system. So let's write A here, the area. Ah, that's not so nice because A was the very connection, but okay. I guess I could call it volume, but then it's annoying because it's 2D. I will call it big A. So calligraphic A, well. That changes everything. Thank you. That's 2 pi square integral over the first brilliant zone of my velocity. OK, so you see what I'm doing. I'm actually building on, these, on this knowledge that we had before, uh, where we derive these uh, velocities. But now I'm considering a field band. So I'm just summing, or in fact inte uh, integrating, over all quasi-momenta to calculate the total velocities. Now you immediately some, uh, see something which is uh, important, which is the fact that upon integration over Q, the band velocity contributions disappear. Okay, so that's the first uh, observation uh, that one should make, which is that the integral of dE over dQ uh, x or y, doesn't matter, it's the same, is strictly equal to zero. This is due to the fact that the, the bands are periodic uh, in Q space, right? This is something that you, you probably learned, which is natural. We have this periodicity in Q space. So that's an important information. Upon filling a band, all velocities or ba all band velocities contribution completely vanish, okay? So in particular, if you look at the total velocity along the y direction, this is you know related to the longitudinal current, this is strictly equal to zero, right? Since the velocity along y only has this contribution from the band velocity, so upon integrating everything, this gives you zero. And this is completely compatible with the idea that we have an, of an insulator, right? So this is compatible with the idea that we have an insulator. What I mean by this is that V y uh, tot is related to the current uh, density uh, uh, along y. And so if you look at the conductivity uh, sigma y y, which is given by this current density along y d uh, divided by the, the force acting on y, this gives me zero. And this is compatible with the idea that we have of an insulator. Okay, it's something which does not conduct. Okay, so far so good. Now what you see is that there is something non-trivial which happens in the transverse direction. In that case, what you find is that the total velocity along x is simply given by the integral. So this part disappears. It will be given by minus Fy integral of this quantity. Right, so minus Fy. Then we have these factors, right? There is this A. Let's divide this by A. Here we have a 2 pi square. And we have the integral over all the brilliant zone of the Berry curvature in this given band. OK, and so now you immediately see where this is going. What we saw previously is that the integration of the Berry curvature over the entire base space, here it's the first brilliant zone. And let me draw right away or write right away the fact that the brilliant zone is in fact a two torus. So this is actually the manifold, the base manifold that we consider, right? We have a system which has uh, periodic boundary conditions, okay, implicitly. So the first brilliant zone is topologically equivalent to a torus. Right? Whenever you, you get out of the first brilliant zone, you re-enter to the other side. So this happens in both directions, so it's a, a two torus. So what you see is that here we integrate the Berry curvature over a closed manifold, and this will be, uh, of course, directly related to this churn number that I have introduced uh, before. So let me be uh, slightly more explicit. So consider now a 2D electron gas. 
right? In that case, I can introduce the current density. Okay, so I will call this uh, Jx. So that's the current density along the transverse direction, direction transverse to the force. So this will simply be given by minus E, uh, the electric charge, the total velocity along X, and then there's uh, one over A, the area of, of my system. The force acting on the system is actually given by the electric field in this context of 2D uh, electron gas. Okay, so in that case, I can simply write that Fy is given by minus E, the electric charge, time the component of the electric field aligned along the Y direction. And let me now fully introduce this uh, definition of the churn number. So this is something that I have introduced in the previous uh, course, right? So it's one over two pi integral over my base space manifold, which is this two torus. Remember the two torus is the first brilliant zone, which is Q space, right? I've been using many different words for essentially the, the same thing uh, of omega xy Okay, so this is the definition of the churn number for this U1 fiber bundle uh, associated with my system, right? A U1 fiber bundle built on uh, the two torus. So when you put all these things together, so when you take this equation here and you introduce this notion of current density, electric field, and you introduce this churn number, what you obtain is that Jx is related to Ey through uh, this quantity here, which is minus E square. So let me reintroduce H bar. So H is two pi H bar. I'm reintroducing my H bar in my calculations. Time the churn number. Okay. So the quantity which appears here is by definition sigma x y. It's the component, the off diagonal component of the t conductivity tensor which relates the current density along x to the electric field applied along y. This, by definition, is minus the whole conductor. Okay, so sigma h is minus sigma xy. So we obtain this important result, which is that sigma h equals to e square over h times the churn number, characterizing my energy band where the, the transport takes place. So to be complete, I should actually, since this churn number is associated with this very curvature defined in the first band, I should actually put a little index here to remind you that every band here is associated with a topological member, right? E1 has a churn number as derived here, but the second band would also have a churn number. But so let me put uh, little indices here in this situation. So again, I said it uh, different uh, many times, but let me emphasize this once again. This churn number, this object which appears in this expression, very simple expression for the whole conductance, this is a topological invariant which classifies these U1 uh, fiber bundles defined over T2. So the idea that you should have is that the base space is this two torus. On every point of the torus or every point of the brilliant zone, you have a U1 fiber, okay? And uh, what this churn number measures is the non-triviality of, of this object, okay? So what this also means is that if sigma h is not equal to zero, that means if the churn number here is non-zero, that means that you cannot define a unique Berry connection, okay? You cannot define a unique Berry connection. Okay, so you have this idea that you actually have this two torus, your brilliant zone. It's impossible to define a single Berry connection in band one, which covers the entire brilliant zone. That's not possible, so you have to play with these little patches, right? So you say, okay, I have some region R1 where I can define or calculate my Berry connection let's call it A1, 
then we have this other region, R2, where I have this very connection, A2. And I have this idea that if the, the conductance or the churn number are, are non-zero, that means that there is this notion of this, uh, of this loop, right, which goes from the boundary delimiting these two regions, R1 and R2, to U1. And this loop is associated with a homotopy class, right? This is what we saw. which is set by the churn number. And if you forget about the E square over H, it is actually set by the whole conductance or whole conductivity in your system. Okay, so it's, it's rather amusing to see how this physical observable, which is so natural, right? It's the response of a system to an external you know, constant force. This quantity actually is related to this homotopy class, which classifies uh, these, uh, these loops in these abstract uh, fiber bundle spaces. So I find this rather, uh, rather elegant. So this formula that we see here, this is what we call the TKNN formula, and it was derived in 1982, I guess. So I've written here, yes. So T stands for Thales, who got the Nobel Prize uh, two years ago. And then there's Komoto, Nightingale, and uh, the Ness. So that was a very important uh, result because it connected uh, this notion of quantized whole conductivity, which was observed in experiment, I will say uh, some words about this in a second, to this notion of topology, right? So that was really a crucial uh, step. But to be complete, the person who realizes that this topological object was really connected to a fiber bundle, that was Barry, the other Barry, Barry Simon, in his paper of 1983. Right, this paper where he also explained that the Berry phase is actually related to this notion of curvature uh, in fiber bundles. So we should add this name over there, I think. So the summary of this is that when you have an insulator, right, so a filled band of fermions, you have this notion of classification that enters. <coughs> There is this idea that when the longitudinal conductance is zero and the, sig and the, the off diagonal components are also zero, so that means that the, the churn number, if you want, is zero, this is what we will call a trivial band insulator. Mathematically, this means that if you are in this situation, you can always define a global, um, a global Berry connection. You can define your, your Bloch states uniformly over the entire brilliant zone. There is absolutely no problem, nor winding, no, no non-triviality in the topological sense. So that's trivial class of insulators. But then there is the situation where, well, the first line is the same, sigma x, x sigma y, y equals zero, okay, and this was what we, we had derived here over there, but the sigma xy is non-zero. So that's the case where the churn number is different from zero. Since these insulators are characterized by this topological number here, which is the churn number, we will call this a churn, and it's a form of topological insulator. And the point that I would like to make is that you cannot go continuously from a situation where you have a trivial band insulator to a situation where you have a churn insulator. Because to go from here to here, you have to change the churn number. The churn number is a topological invariant, so you're doing something extremely violent to your system. So you see there is this notion of classification. Right? We try to classify different states of matter, in this case different insulators, based on the notion of topology, a notion of topological uh, invariant. Okay, so I'm insisting on this, the way that I'm classifying states here, has nothing to do with uh, defining a local order parameter. Here, the entire classification is based on these notions of topology, yes. 
No, because. Okay, you, you could propose this to the community if you want, but I think it. <laughs> uh, I think the first thing people look at, you know, when you act on a system and uh, you know along some direction and you try to measure the current along this direction, in that case you basically have nothing, so it really looks like an insulator. Sure, I, I, I see what you mean. Okay, it's through the topology that it actually conducts, and so okay, I, I agree. Okay, let's change it. I, I don't mind. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes in certain uh, situations. Uh, I will not discuss that here. But what I can tell you in two lines is that if you have a two-band model, right, if my Hamiltonian in Q space can be written as some vector here, which depends on Q times a vector of poly matrices, right, I have dx sigma x plus dy sigma y, etc. What I can do, so this is my Hamiltonian, I'm not diagonalizing it, but I can introduce a vector field n of Q. Again, another n, I'm sorry for that, but this is how we call it. Uh, so yes, we have this vector n of q, which is given by the norm of d. Okay, so I'm, I'm taking d here, and I divide it by its norm. Okay? In fact, I can rewrite, it's actually simple to show, that's an exercise for you. Uh, it's simple to show that this very curvature, uh, which appears here, can be simply written in terms of this vector n here. Right. So uh, as you as you mentioned this before, I, I gave you an expression of this omega in terms of partial derivatives of block states, etc. But if you give me this d vector here, if you give me your Hamiltonian, I can calculate this n, and then I can calculate uh, something that is called the Pondry-Agin form. It's the uh, scalar product of n with partial derivative of n over d q x uh, cross d n d q y. Right, this is a vector, this is a vector, I take the cross product, I take the scalar product. This is actually related uh, to the Berry curvature at some point Q in the lowest band. So, so we have a two band model, okay, and then there will be a plus minus here in front depending on whether you look at the uh, upper band or lower band. And so indeed, you give me this H, I can calculate the Berry curvature simply by calculating this, then I integrate this over the brilliant zone and I get the chain number. Yes, of course. It's the, it's the way to demonstrate it, but... Okay. Okay, then you can make a whole conductance measurement. Okay. It's okay, so you want a, a theoretical technique which allows you to calculate the, the churn number, but which doesn't rely at all on the diagonalization. Yeah, you, you, you have to know in advance that you have a band structure, that you indeed, that you, you, you are in a given band, that this band is well separated by a gap from other band. That's yes, so, so we can, yes, so indeed, I, I, we could discuss that. There are generalizations of these things. Uh, we can write things in terms of a projector uh, onto our ground state, but then again you will tell me, but then you know you what your ground state is. But indeed you can generalize these things and even write uh, these topological invariants in terms of green functions, and then you know that this completely applies to interacting systems. So if your main question is, can this be generalized to interacting systems? Uh, I didn't understand that that was the question, but then yes, in certain c circumstances it is possible. And I can explain this to you, but this is not, uh, yes. Yes. No, so that's an important point. 
the phases that I'm discussing here, these churn insulating states, are not protected by any symmetry, right? I'm going to say a couple of words uh, here in a couple of seconds, I think, on this. The requirement that you have to, uh, to have a non-zero churn number is that you actually break some reversal symmetry. But that's essentially the only requirement. People have been classifying other uh, states of matter based on topology, but also symmetries of the system. So this leads to the symmetry protected um, uh, states of matter. But these types of systems do not enter, uh, or at least it's an example where the symmetry does not play a role. Symmetry of the lattice in particular does not play any role. No. Okay, so I still have many things to say and I see that I still have only have half an hour. So let me select things a little bit. Um, yes, I'm going to, to discuss this and then it will be essentially the end. Okay, so what I suggest to do now is to give you first uh, a very short uh, historic uh, view on this problem and then fully solve a two-band model, not using this trick that I showed you there. But it will be interesting because it will, it will be based on the so-called Haldane model, which was introduced by Duncan Haldane, who also got the Nobel Prize two years ago. And as you will see, it will be a nice way to, to end these lectures because we will basically see all the structures that we've been learning throughout uh, the three sets, uh, of the, I mean, the, the set of three lectures. So let me explain this. And then I hope I will still have some time to say something about cold atoms. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so let me go very rapidly uh, through this and then let's see how this goes. Okay, so the main question is, when is this churn number non-zero? Okay, I showed you that sigma h, when I have an insulator, can be written as e square over h uh, time, uh, uh, time this churn number, but the main question is, when is this thing non-zero? And perhaps before uh, addressing this question, let me first tell you when this effect was first observed. Actually, it was observed before it was predicted. Okay, so the first experimental observation was, uh, was done by von Klitzing in 1980, who got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And so the idea is that he considered a 2D electron gas, right, we have our electron here, with a very strong magnetic field, transfers to this plane. And what he did is that he measured the whole conductance in this system. So what did he see? Here I'm going to plot 1 over sigma h as a function of the magnetic field. This was done at low temperatures. What he saw is that that small field, while well the system behaved classically essentially, so the whole resistivity behaved linearly with B. But then at after some point, he started to see some plateaus. Okay, like this. Here, the magnetic field was of the order of a few Tesla. And indeed, these plateaus were found to be extremely robust. They were confirmed by many other experiments using many different types of materials in many different uh, situations. So there was this idea of universality, right? That these plateaus should always be there once you're at sufficiently uh, low temperatures and large magnetic fields. Okay, so what, what he saw is that indeed sigma H on these plateaus was given by e square over h, this is an h, times uh, some integer. Okay, so this is what we call the integer quantum hole effect. Okay, now as I told you, the topological interpretation of this effect was provided by uh, Tholes and co-workers, so there is this TK and paper of uh, 1982, and, uh, and then there were lots of works that try to, to generalize this. So it was generalized to interacting system uh, in the so-called fractional quantum hole effect. But this is something that I'm not uh, going to describe here. So a major step was uh, performed by Haldane in 1988. What was this step? It was to realize that in order to see these plateaus, you didn't necessarily need um, this notion of a magnetic field uh, acting on particles moving in a 2D plane. So at this, uh, you know, before this work, we thought that this quantization of the quantum hole conductivity was truly due to the Landau levels, right? The eigenstates that are associated with, uh, with, 
par charged particles in a magnetic field. So what he realized is that the only requirement, the only thing that you need in order to have this quantization is to break time reversal symmetry. Okay? So formally, what I can write down on the board today, using all this knowledge that we have developed, is that the time reversal, let me call this T, uh, the time reversal operation acting on the Berry curvature, this actually gives you minus omega xy minus q. Okay, so this can be simply obtained by looking at this uh, uh, expression that I gave you uh, before. So indeed, what this means is that if you have a system which has time reversal symmetry, well, what you have is that sigma xy minus q is minus omega xy q. And what this means is that the integral of this quantity over the first brilliant zone is necessarily zero. Okay, so from, from this simple argument, what you see is that the churn number is non-zero if and only if you break time reversal symmetry. Okay, that's a very important uh, notion. But that's the only symmetry argument that uh, we're going to be using. So what is the Haldane model? Haldane introduced a model which explicitly breaks time reversal symmetry but which does not include a magnetic field or uh, a uniform magnetic field. So the Haldane model is the following. You have a honeycomb lattice. So this is essentially graphene. Okay, this is such a, a honeycomb lattice here. Graphene would consist in simply considering this uh, nearest neighbor tunneling between neighboring sites. Okay, this is just a piece of my lattice, but I'm not going to cover the entire board. So there is this NN hopping between neighbors, neighboring sites, which is characterized by this parameter T1. But then he introduces hopping between next nearest neighbor uh, sites. So let me call these inequivalent sites A and B on the honeycomb lattice. What this means is that neighboring hopping connects the B to the A sites. But then Haldane introduces, I should probably use another color, I guess. He introduces these N and N hopping terms that connects the A's to the A's and the B's to the B's. But importantly, these hoppings are not real valued, they're actually complex valued. So let's put minus I T2, T2 is the amplitude, that's a real number. But then there is a minus I here, and it's a minus I upon going along this direction, and the hopping would be reversed if I was going along the other direction, I would have plus i. Okay, I want my Hamiltonian to be Hermitian. Okay, so what you see is that without this NNN hopping, the system does not break time reversal symmetry. There is no notion of, of chirality or privilege orientation, if you want, like you would have in a magnetic field, which introduces such a notion of chirality. So with graphene only, this doesn't happen. But if you add this NNN hopping terms that Haldane is introducing, you actually introduce this notion of time reversal symmetry breaking. Okay, so my Hamiltonian can be simply written as T1 sum over nearest neighboring sites plus this T2 sum over NNN sites of some term which goes like I, which is either plus or minus I, whether I go along one direction or the other. Okay, I'm not going to write the term, but this is just uh, a two-band tight binding model on the honeycomb lattice. Right. So I'm going to write um, my, uh, my Hamiltonian in momentum representation. I'm going to write this H Q as G of Q, F of Q, F Q minus G Right, so F describes the NN hopping term, so F describes hopping from A to B, and the Gs, they describe the NNN uh, hopping terms. So in terms of band structures, let me just draw this. When T2 equals to zero, the bands display the, the famous Dirac cones that you have in graphene. 
So the two bands actually touch at equal zero. And once T2 is different from zero, then you have a gap opening at these Dirac points. Okay, so in that case, when T2 is different from zero, actually when you break time reversal symmetry, you remove these singularities. In that case, you indeed have a notion of a single band here, E plus, uh, yeah, this word, E minus, and a single band here, E plus. Okay, this is what it does. Right. Now I'm going to, to solve this thing in the following way. I'm going to write, I'm going to introduce two spherical uh, coordinates, theta and phi. So I'm going to write cosine theta being equal to g divided by my di dispersion E of q in, ampl in, a, in absolute value. So g also depends on q, right? And theta, therefore, also depends on q. But I'm not going to, to write this systematically. OK, and then f of q, this is a complex function, which appears here in this two, uh, two times two matrix. I'm going to introduce the angle, or the, the phase. So I will have the amplitude of f. Then I will take the phase uh, equal to phi. OK, so I'm now introducing these two angles, theta and phi. And in this language, I can therefore write h of q as the dispersion in, in absolute value. And then I have this rather standard way to write uh, a two-band uh, or two-level two system in terms of the spherical coordinates. Right? which is uh, something that, of course, I, I can diagonalize. I can introduce the, the lowest energy uh, eigenstate. So I will call it u minus. So this can be written as minus e to the minus i phi uh, sine theta over 2. And here I have cosine theta over 2. Right? So from these eigenstates, I can derive uh, the Berry connection. So let's do this. That's, that's the momentum representation. So I have two uh, inequivalent lattice sites. Yes, here, A and B. OK, so my unit cell is composed of these two sites. So when I, uh, when I go in momentum representation, I end up with uh, Hamiltonian momentum representation, which is 2 times 2, right? It's, it's the, the Fourier uh, transform of my tight binding uh, Hamiltonian defined in real space, right? I, I have this tight binding model. I go to k-space. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, we have A and B. These are two non-equivalent uh, lattice sites. So I can write down the Berry connection. Remember, what is the definition of the Berry connection in the lowest band? This can be written as I u minus. Now we have this Nabla operator with respect to Q space, u minus. OK, so we just have to take the derivatives of this object with respect to uh, Qx and Qy, take the scalar product. And what this gives us is 1 over 2, 1 minus cosine theta grad phi. Now this should look familiar to you. This was actually the gauge potential for the monopole problem for a monopole charge g equals one half. So for a monopole charge uh, equal to one. So this is equivalent to the gauge potential A for a monopole with g equals to one half. And remember that it's 2G that should be quantized. OK, so that's already something interesting. When you solve a two-level system or two-band uh, system, the natural Berry connection that you get when expressed in these angles is actually the connection uh, that we naturally found uh, in the monopole problem. OK, so this is uh, quite nice. I think it makes a connection with the first, uh, the first lecture. 
So let's play the same game uh, as the one we played in the context of the monopole. So let's ask ourselves, when is A singular? Right? If there is some topology in this problem, as I told you before, if the churn number is non-zero, that necessarily means that I cannot define a Berry connection uniformly over my entire uh, space, which is Q space here. So when is this A uh, singular? So first of all, it is singular if phi is ill-defined. And when is phi ill-defined? Let's look at this definition here. It's ill-defined when this complex function goes to zero. Okay, so when f of q goes to zero. So this is what I would call a vortex, right? We have this complex uh, function which is defined uh, in Q space, there might be a point where this function goes to zero, okay, exactly at this point the phase of this complex uh, number is not well defined, there will be a winding of this phase around this vortex, and this will play an important role in the following. But so let's just look at the very connection for now, and we realize that it will be ill-defined whenever f of Q equals to zero. But then we also need theta to be equal to pi, right? Because if, if, let's look at A, if theta equals zero, okay, this uh, thing uh, uh, gives you something finite, and so A will be, uh, Ill, um, sorry, this will be zero, so this will be well defined. But if theta equals pi, then you get something which is finite, and upon having phi which is ill-defined, you will have something which is indeed singular. So we, we indeed need this notion of a theta being uh, equal to phi, which uh, means that g of q should actually be uh, negative. Okay, this is a requirement. If theta equals pi, this thing is negative, so g should be negative. So when, when do these two things happen? Yes. The, the, the yes, that, that, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm anticipating. But actually, whenever this thing is, is equal to zero in this graphene problem, G can either be, uh, the G will be su in such a way that theta is either zero uh, or pi. I mean, it's, it, it, it's something that, that happens in this context, but you're completely right. So the first condition, let me write this here, this actually selects two point in Q space. This only happens for Q equals Q Dirac point or the other Dirac point. So let me just draw this here. So I told you that we had two Dirac points here. So let's add an axis here, Q. So this is one Dirac point in Q space. This is the other Dirac point in Q space. So what I'm saying is that this F function vanishes exactly at these two points in Q space. So if you, want, if you want, we have this notion of a vortex at the Dirac points. So that's one condition. We, we will either have a singularity here or here. And the second condition, this actually selects one of these Dirac points. So this selects Q, let's call it QD. So that's uh, an important observation. You can go through the details and calculate all this to, to be sure that it's well under control. But indeed, what you find is that this very connection, which I have derived here from this state, is well defined everywhere except at one of the Dirac points of my spectrum. Okay. So similarly, I can introduce another uh, Berry connection also related to the lowest energy band, but now I'm just making a gauge a transformation. Let me just give you the, the value of this. This is exactly what we wrote uh, for the monopole problem. This one will be well-defined everywhere except at the other Dirac point. So it's singular at QD prime. Okay. So now you see where, where I'm going. If you have your two torus, which is the first brilliant zone, I have, two I have two Dirac points in here. 
let's have QD here, QD prime there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is introduce some, some regions here. I will call this region R2. And in this region, I can introduce or define this Berry connection A tilde. And in the other region here, which I will call R1, I can introduce uh, the, the first Berry connection that I had introduced before, which was simply uh, A. Right? I told you that A was well defined everywhere except at the uh, QD. So such a, a definition of my Berry uh, connections, such a partitioning, if you want, is well defined. And yes? They both refer to the lowest band. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. That's precisely that. Yes, but I'm making a, a gauge transformation. It's the only thing I'm doing. It's the only thing I'm doing. I take this eigenstate, I derive A, then I make a gauge transformation, I have a new A, which is A tilde. One is singular at one point, the other is singular at the other point. And now, the end of the story is, is simple. The churn number, as defined before, is just 1 over 2 pi, integral over the boundary between the two regions of A minus A tilde. So indeed, you're right, this is always referred to the lowest band. So this is exactly the same thing as for the calculation uh, of the monopole. This will be the circulation around the boundary of uh, this grad phi. And as I said, you can check. So remember that phi is this phase associated with this uh, function here. What we're doing is that we're calculating the circulation of this phase around the boundary here. So we calculate the circulation of this phase around the Dirac point. So this Dirac point is precisely this point where this complex function goes to zero. So this is this vortex. So what we're calculating here is the circulation of this vortex phase around the vortex core. And it turns out that this is actually a, a normal vortex with a unit winding. And so this simply gives you 2 pi. Again, you can verify this by calculating the explicit components of f and g for this two-band model, that's a three-line calculation, and you can verify that indeed it has this winding uh, structure. Okay, so this is a, a demonstration that the Haldane model, as defined here, indeed introduces gaps in this graphene uh, system, and if you look at the churn number of the lowest band, it is equal to one, meaning that if I fill the lowest band, okay, with some fermions, the whole conductivity will indeed be given by e square over h time one, namely something which is non-zero. So that was really important. As I said, this really uh, elucidated this question of whether the quantum Hall effect could be seen beyond the standard problem of a 2D ele um, uh, electron gas in a magnetic field. So that was super uh, important. As a technical remark, note that what is really crucial is that this G function here, so I told you that G function, which appears in this matrix, which has to do with this NNN hopping, this G function has this property that it has different signs at the two Dirac points. And this is what selects a, a, a unique Dirac point here in this analysis of the singularity of A. This is not something that happens in all two-band models, right? I mean, you can write all two-band models in, in this way, more or less, but this property that this G changes values at these uh, two uh, singular points uh, is something which really crucial and leads you to this quantization. And this is actually a consequence of um, time reversal symmetry being broken. Okay, good. Well, I still have uh, five minutes or a little bit more, so I can spend this time to discuss some uh, cold atom um, experiments and results. Yes. Uh, no. I mean, the one half that comes uh, in the expression for the Berry connection? I mean, that. Ah. 
Okay, okay, so what you So so it, it it in the end it has to do with well the vorticity of this phase. Uh, right? I, if this phase winds several times around uh, the vortex, you will get a churn number two, three, four, etc. This is where you, you would get uh, something non, non trivial. Es essentially. No, 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 because no, no, because this term here has nothing to do with the magnetic field. Ah, okay. So now what you say is that you don't take simple graphene; you take graphene, including this term, and then on top of that you add a magnetic field. Y you will have a, com a competition between the two effects. Yes, of course. Yeah, yes, you're right. It's completely right. Okay. So perhaps I'm going to write less and uh, and say more. <laughs> so, but still, I want. So this would be, you know, a few experimental. Uh, ah, this title is different here. A few experimental um, measurements or explorations in quantum engineered uh, systems. So the first thing I wanted to say was, well, we introduced this Haldane model. Can one actually realize this Haldane model in nature? Okay, so the Haldane model. How can we realize this? So graphene, this is something that we can realize in nature. That's not a problem. But then how can you generate this term? This is a rather crazy term. Well, it was suggested by Aoki and Oka, that if you take your piece of graphene and you irradiate it with circularly polarized light, the circularly polarized light can be described by a, a, a time periodic uh, potential, right? So my Hamiltonian will include a term which goes like x cosine omega t plus y sine omega t. Right, so my total Hamiltonian would be my graphene Hamiltonian, simple graphene, plus this time-dependent potential. So this also depends on time. What they show is that since this, uh, th this is a time-periodic problem, right, you can go in the omega goes to infinity limit. You can treat this as a, a flocket system, as we call this today. And what you can do is derive an effective time-independent Hamiltonian that describes the long time dynamics of your system. And what you can show in a couple of lines is that this effective Hamiltonian is equivalent to the Haldane, to the Haldane model that I have written here in this limit where omega goes to infinity. What this actually means is omega much, much larger than the hopping strength that characterizes you know, the energy in my graphene system. Right, you see what I'm doing? I'm taking graphene, I'm forgetting here this. I only have this term. This gives me these Dirac cones. But then I irradiate my system with this circularly polarized light. I take this limit where omega, h bar omega, is much larger than T1. And I can derive an effective Hamiltonian. And in the lowest approximation, this gives me the Haldane model. Okay, so this is super nice. It was not done yet, actually, in nature. But what people have done are um, generalizations of these ideas to other uh, quantum engineered systems. So one realization was to do this in photonics. That was the first realization. Photonics. That was performed in the group of uh, Mati Segev and uh, Alex uh, Zamait. And here I'm not going to draw everything because I obviously don't have the time. Here the idea is that they have uh, a couple of waveguides that they set on some ex uh, hexagonal lattice. Okay, so this is a fictitious uh, honeycomb lattice, but they have these waveguides which are set, you know, in this, in this 2D plane. So this, this is the 2D plane XY, 
But then along the z direction, we have the propagation of light along these waveguides. Okay, but these waveguides are arranged ar along a honeycomb-shaped uh, lattice. Now, if you don't do anything to this, what you can show is that the dynamics, well, it's not really the dynamics, the, the evolution along z, so if I interpret z as being t, if you want, this is strictly equivalent to the graphene model, right? Because there is evanescent coupling between my waveguides. But now what the trick that they did to reproduce what Aoki and, and Okab suggested was to introduce the equivalent of this time periodic circular modulation. So what they did is that they actually built waveguides that were helical, right? They were twirling like this along the Z, which is the time, fictitious time direction. And so when you do this, you actually have a system which is, again, described by an effective Hamiltonian, which is equivalent to the Haldane model, okay? So this was done in photonics in the year uh, 2013, as I said, in the group of Mati Segev. And then, so that was in photonics, in cold atoms, people have done very similar things in the group of Tilman Esslinger in Zurich and in the group of Klaus Sengstock in Hamburg. What they did is that they built a honeycomb optical lattice they put atoms in this honeycomb optical lattice, and then they shake this lattice circularly. Okay, all this is strictly equivalent to the uh, Aoki and Oka uh, idea. You introduce a potential, which is this one, and when I shake a lattice circularly, and if I go in the frame that moves with this lattice, the potential that I, f that I feel is indeed this one. I have a gradient along one direction, a gradient along the other direction. So this was done in, in Zurich and, uh, in, um, and, and I said in, in Hamburg. So these were, uh, so I should say, you know, ETH and Hamburg. So these are cold atom realizations. Now, none of these experiments, neither this one or these ones, measured the churn number. Okay, so they showed evidence that they measured, uh, that they uh, created the Haldane model. So they saw features of these models, but they were not able to, pr to probe the topological number, which is this churn number. So this measurement was performed uh, in Munich in another cold atom experiment. And I will end with this. So that was performed in the group of uh, Emmanuel Bloch in an experiment uh, that was led by Monica Eidelsberger. And so let me just tell you uh, in a couple of uh, seconds what they did. So here, instead of considering a honeycomb optical lattice, they considered a 2D square lattice for rubidium uh, atoms. Then what they did is that they generated a synthetic magnetic field. So something that produces something which resembles a magnetic flux in the 2D lattice. This actually achieves what one calls the Hofstadter model, which was also realized at MIT in the group of uh, Wolfgang Ketele. So what they did is that they set the flux to some value. So the, the number of flux quanta uh, was one fourth, just to be precise. And the band structure associated with just a system, so this is Q, this is E, displays uh, essentially three bands. Well actually, there are two bands that touch here, so actually there are four bands. But this lowest band here is extremely flat, and it has a churn number equal to one. And now what they did is that they filled this lattice, as, as I said, with rubidium uh, atoms, and these atoms are actually boson. So that's the funny thing. They're actually doing a quantum hole experiment, if you want, but using bosonic particles. But these bo bosonic particles didn't fall in, in these little wells there because the band was super, super flat, and with temperature effects and possibly some interactions that we had problems identifying, uh, but at least it was very clear that this band was actually uniformly filled with these bosons. And this could be uh, verified through band mapping. So in this situation where all bosons ended up in this band here, what they did is that they simply pushed uh, the, the particles along one direction. So they generated uh, a force simply using some optical uh, linear gradient. And what they measured is the center of mass displacement of the cloud. So that's your atomic cloud. It lives on this 2D lattice. They acted uh, with a force along the Y direction. And what they measured is the center of mass uh, motion along the transverse direction. And one can show quite easily that the velocity of the center of mass along the X direction 
is just the, the current density along the x direction divided by the, the particle density. And so indeed, if you are in this situation where a band with non-zero turn number is uniformly filled, well, this center of mass velocity, and in particular, the, the displacement of the center of mass along the transverse direction, immediately gives you uh, the value of the churn number of the band that you built. And experimentally, they measured a churn number, which was 0 0.99, with some small error, uh, for, this, for this band uh, structure. So that was the first churn number uh, measurement in the cold atom system. The amusing fact is that this was done with bosonic uh, particles, and it was quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, achievement. So I will stop here. I will just uh, mention that there are indeed many other types of topological uh, states of matter in nature. In these lectures, I tried to go very, very slowly through these notions of topology and geometry. Um, I think that the resolution of this Haldane model kind of closes the story in a rather nice way because it connects all these notions that we learned uh, throughout uh, these lectures. And uh, so, indeed, there are still many, many interesting things to say about these topological states, which are explored nowadays. I just sketched here a couple of ideas regarding current experimental um, investigations, both on the Haldane model side, but also other types of models that lead uh, to non-zero churn number, which led to convincing measurements of these uh, topological uh, things. And of course, nowadays, there are lots of uh, new types of measurements of topological transport uh, which have been developed. I mentioned this experiment of Jan Spinman, where he measured the second churn number. There is an experiment that we uh, performed uh, in Hamburg uh, quite recently. I say we because I contributed to this, where we actually measured the churn number by heating up the system. So there is a funny uh, idea that you can relate the topology of your system to the heating rates of the system that you shake very hard. Uh, so this is something that we suggested two years ago and which was realized in the group uh, of Klaus uh, Sankstock. And so the, there, are, there are these ideas that using cold, ultra-cold matter, one can look at all these topological properties uh, from very different uh, aspects and also study new states of matter. I think the measurement of the second churn number uh, at NIST uh, is a rather interesting uh, example of that. So I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, well, have a safe trip back. Thank you. Everybody have to go. <laughs> no, thank you. I think it's good thank to stop here. Thank you.